and we welcome you to another edition of the Durham Bulls podcast, which is where the Durham Bulls fans know to come to celebrate all the great traditions and history that make up the Durham Bulls. I'm Patrick Keenis, the broadcaster for the Bulls, and if this is the first time you've been with us, we welcome you. If you're returning, thanks for coming back, and you can subscribe on Apple, subscribe on Spotify, and you can watch this podcast on our YouTube channel, Durham Bulls TV, and you'll get notifications every Monday as the new podcast drops. Well, we've had some interesting guests over the first three, three and a half months of this podcast from the Hall of Fame Bulls managers from Charlie Montoya to Bill Evers. We've had Miles Masterboni with the Cubs. We have had Ryan Stanek, who's now pitching for Seattle. We had Jim Morris, the rookie, uh, join us just a couple of weeks ago to talk about his uh, unique journey to Major League Baseball. And it's a, a, a great privilege to catch up with a good friend of mine who I've known since I broke into AAA in 2012, which was his first year at AAA with the Durham Bulls. And it is now the former big leaguer and director of baseball operations now with the Tampa Bay Rays, Cole Figueroa. Cole, greetings. Thanks for your time. How are you? I'm doing well, Patrick. How are you doing? Doing great. Doing great. And it's so good to see you. We, we come across each other usually once or twice a summer since you moved from the field to the front office. So for the Bulls fans who want to try and follow the arc of your career and kind of the job description of what you're doing now with the Tampa Bay Rays, how would you describe what your kind of day-to-day -day schedule is like and what you do? Um, yeah, I guess I'll start with the the arc of the career, I guess, or the trajectory or lack thereof. Um, <laughs> my last year playing was 16. Uh, I was, I tell people all the time, I was so good in 16. I made the opening day uh, roster for the Pirates, the 25 man at the time. And then by the, by November of 16, I believe I was at my cubicle at Trop. <laughs> so it was a little bit of a whirlwind of a year, uh, going from the joys of making an open a roster to, you know, working kind of what people think of as like a nine to five going into the office every day. Uh, so that was, that was definitely a little bit of a shock to me. Uh, but it's worked out about as well as it can. And, you know, I've gone from, many different roles within the Rays mm -hmm. um, from player development and now working uh, on our major league roster. Um, it's been, mm -hmm. it's been a great kind of ride, I guess, for lack of a better term. Uh, but yeah, now my day to day is mostly, you know, helping on our, the major league side. It can be from anywhere from transactions to free agency to being a helpful hand wherever I can be doing some odd ends there. And then also with our junior staff, um, trying to make an impact with people coming into the office for the first time. I know me being a close to a 30 year old when my first uh, project came across my desk relative to some, a lot of them coming out of college uh, for the first yeah. time. So just a little bit more lived experience. And I really enjoy just yeah. kind of uh, that mentorship part of it. So, so many different tangents from your first answer. So what was the first project that came across your desk when you're 30 working nine to five with the Rays? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the first project, uh, I think off the top of my head was I did some um, kind of strategy based things and one I can remember pretty vividly. Uh, and it's been a little bit of time passed, so it's not a big deal at the moment. So um, I believe we were playing Boston. I was doing some advanced work. Um, and at the time, I was um, kind of running kind of point for the major league uh, staff day to day with Eric. And he had asked me to look into uh, Dylan Batances and mm -hmm. maybe some optimal strategies of how do you hit this guy? At the time, he was <laughs> unhittable, uh, literally uh, unhittable. And I think I, you know, I thought I was being smart uh, or being of what I thought was smart. And I come up with this strategy of, hey, what if we uh, what if we take some until we get to two strikes against this guy? And because at the time he had a pretty high strike or walk rate and he was striking out everyone. And even if you put the ball in play, it was like pretty low probability that you're going to get a hit mm -hmm. and so I type it all up I send it to Haim he's like oh send it to Motor see what he says <laughs> so I send it to Motor I don't hear anything back this is right before the game uh so I'm watching the game and Dellen is uh warming up in in the bullpen mm. and I'm watching it and my my heart's starting to race I'm like oh this is this is it right here this is my <laughs> time to shine and so he comes in and I kid you not he almost does the Greg Maddox on us like strike one <laughs> Strike two, strike three, see you later. And the first two pitches the, the player takes, and my heart is dropping. I'm just like, I've completely ruined, every, I've ruined everything. Uh, and I'm just like, I might as well just pack up my computer now. 
I, you know, you fail as a, a player, you could take that. You fail in the office, and you're like, what mm -hmm. can I do at this point? So um, huh. funny thing is, I don't get anything that night. It was a late game, and I get an email, I think, from from uh, Chad Matola, Motor, the next day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he's like, hey, Figgy, just wanted to thank you for uh, this research. <laughs> and I'm just waiting for the punchline. He goes, yeah. luckily, uh, I actually didn't get your email until this morning. Uh. And I was like, oh, oh God. <laughs> thank God. <laughs> We're talking about the relief that's over my body at this point. Um, so so he's like, I appreciate you putting this all together. We can talk about it later. I think for right now, just based off last night, he seems like he's in the zone. So <laughs> we can show. he knows like, oh, no crap. Uh, but thank you. Uh, so, yeah, that was that was a very long winded way of going through my first project. And I can laugh about it now. I think. The best part of it was, I think, at the time, Jaime was trying to kind of create a point there and saying that, you know, you've developed some skills in the office and we really appreciate those. But really think about it from your perspective as a baseball player. Mm. And I think at that time, you know, me trying to be new in the office, trying to show I can do other things beyond just, you know, give my two cents. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think I kind of lost that humility a little bit uh, in that moment. So I thought it was a good lesson. Uh, lesson learned, uh, put myself in the player's shoes a little bit more often, even though that seems obvious mm -hmm. being a former player. But um, yeah, it was it was interesting. That's just a classic story. And then if the podcast ended right now, the fans would get exactly what they wanted out of a discussion with Cole Figueroa. So I, I, I've never asked you this, but having been at AAA for so long now and seen guys who go to the big leagues, come back down and just kind of hang on three, four, five years, maybe play overseas. You elected not to do that, though. At the end of 16, you kind of bounced around to a couple of teams in AAA at the end of 16, ended with New Orleans, and then that was it. And then you went straight to the front office with the Rays. Uh, why Why didn't you? I mean, was was that, was the was the thirst quenched of big league baseball? Had it been such a, a huge shift in 2016 that you thought that was it and it was the right time? But wh wh why didn't you uh, pursue baseball any, any longer than you did? That's a good question. I think I had some opportunities to keep playing, I think at the time, and a lot of players experienced this, and it was something I was grateful to experience, but at the time it was uh, it was difficult. Um, I was going around the waiver wire, DFA'd a few times. Mm -hmm. uh, I think at the time I had three different rents in a few different cities uh, because <laughs> of how much we were traveling. I was putting a lot of mileage on my car. I believe we went from Pittsburgh to Indianapolis to Nashville to Oklahoma City to New Orleans that right. year, all right. in a car. Um, and it can take a toll on the family. It can take a toll on you mentally. And I think the stressors that that brings, and I don't, it's not meaning to be uh, poor me because it was an unbelievable opportunity. You get to live out your dreams of possibly being a big leaguer and even playing in AAA. That was, you know, it's a great experience. Um, but I think for me personally at the time, it was something that, uh, it was a little bit of a gut check and it, was it something I wanted to continue to do or to potentially start something that I had a lot of interest in from being around time mm -hmm. and Eric and Andrew in Tampa yeah. uh, during those years and them really kind of opening up my eyes to things beyond just playing. When I first came across you again, 2012 was my first year with the Bulls. It was the, the, your first year getting to Tripoli with the Rays in Durham. Uh, certain Certain attributes stick out to you. A, your gritty ability to play the game, your talent, your determination, and your smarts. And as I watched you play even then, I thought, you know, this guy is going to be just a blue-collar, big-leaguer, utility guy. Put me in any time. I will help you be a better team. Or I thought you'd be a politician. <laughs> so I thought I thought those are two, the, 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 the two different lanes I saw for you, you know, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Um, where, where, where did your baseball acumen, because it is different from many of the others that I've come across. What was that, was that rooted in your, in your you know, childhood years with your father who played in the big leagues and grinded out years in minor league baseball or, or somewhere else? Uh, yeah, I think naturally growing up in a baseball <clears throat> family, it's, it's something you gravitate to You're around baseball, good baseball people all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, you get to ask questions. I was always really curious, uh, would be in the manager's office. My dad was a manager, but also a hitting yeah. coach. So I would be, yeah. um, in manager's offices all the time, just talking baseball. So yeah, I don't, I don't know where that was going to eventually take me, but it was something that I always had great dialogue with people, both on field and off the field. Um, 
I don't know about politics. It's not something I particularly love <laughs> in, my, in just my normal life. Uh, but yeah, I'm glad baseball worked out okay. Um, and and the opportunities that came after, I just I'm so thankful to even have those opportunities because it is really difficult. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to make this sound like a sad story, but it is difficult for players to transition after um yeah, and yeah. really find what their their passions are because you you play baseball at such a high level you're so competitive and you're you're afraid you're going to lose that edge in the next mm-hmm. thing that you do um and you're always chasing that a little bit so uh it's something i am passionate about when when former players or current players reach out to me about well, hey next steps you know it's something i always try to take some time mm-hmm. out and just talk through with them and you're reading my notes because that was one of the questions i wanted to ask you is kind of juxtapose winning on the field, playing on the field versus operationally playing to win off of the field, which is now what you're doing with the Rays, but you're so integral to uh, Durham's success and Tampa Bay's success and your time with the Yankees, your time with the Pirates, but it's different now. And as a competitor, how how do you, how do you counterbalance um, the on the field versus off the field with the same objective of winning championships? Yeah, I, I think the good thing is that you and you never quite feel that edge again like you were as a player. It's just a different mm-hmm. feeling. I think that's helped me in a lot of ways, not get too high or too low uh, when you do see people either fail um, and even succeed on the field. Um, it's very easy to get wrapped up emotionally into the games day to day, and I really try to kind of keep a level head because I know it's a long season, and I also know mm-hmm. what those players are going through when they're really struggling trying to find their way through. Um, I So from, from like a competitive standpoint there it's not quite the same but i would say that there are different avenues um especially with us being the rays um and the opportunities that Stu allows us to kind of explore uh i think that that helps kind of keep my juices flowing and there's always mm-hmm. something out there if you think you have it figured out you're far from if it's either from player development or player acquisition um there are so n- so many numerous uh roads you could go down and once you kind of lose that, I think that's when you fall behind, especially for mm-hmm. us. Um, so, yeah, there's plenty of avenues to really kind of itch that scratch. Well, what's interesting about spending so much time in Durham and seeing a, a whole myriad of different type of people and players come through is, again, you can kind of see them down the road where where you think they would be a best fit when when the playing career is done, whenever that is. And the Rays have an uncanny ability of developing people who are either great coaches, great managers, or outstanding reps in front offices of big league baseball from Brandon Gomes to Chris Archer. I mean, it's a long, long list of managers, too many to, to kind of expound on from, you know, Baldelli and Shelton and, you know, Madden and Kevin Cash. And again, a long, long list. Um, Was, was this path always in the back of your mind, even when you were playing of getting into the front office? I mean, do you want, do you aspire to follow a Peter Bendix and a Brandon Gomes and an Andrew Friedman. Do you want to run a team down the road if you are given the opportunity? What, what, well, how, how do you see yourself if you play that game? Where's Cole Figueroa in 10 or 15 years? How would you answer that? Good question. I think getting into the office a little bit later, that, that drive to be the number one person has not always been the top of my list. I know this is going to be cliche to some extent, but it really hasn't. Um, I think those opportunities, kind of like playing in the big leagues, like, yeah, you need to have uh, the right mentality and the skill set and all those things, but there are so few of those jobs. So to kind of right. mark your career mm-hmm. uh, and everything that comes under it as like that being the be all end all, I think um, that's probably not the right way to look at it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think just being within a group that you feel like your voice is heard, um, you're doing work that is going to really strong decisions. Um I think that's kind of what fulfills me and being around people that mm-hmm. I like to be around. Um, I think not necessarily like-minded, but just the culture of having good people around really yeah. kind of keeps everyone coming to the office every day, yeah. uh, getting through the tough times when the team's not playing as well. And then when we get to celebrate, it makes those times even mm-hmm. even more special. So I think that's really kind of what gets me going. And that's why I like yeah. being with the race so much because, you know, we have that kind of culture that Eric and our leadership have kind of put together. And, you know, we all have a good time while we also work really hard. I mean, I think that's the healthy answer is to to not be so singularly focused on, it has to be this. And if you don't reach this, 
And then what have you been wasting all of your years for? I think that I think it's a very healthy, uh, emotionally healthy answer to say, you know, just being part of the team, being in, in a spot where you're enjoyed and, and your voice is heard, as you mentioned. So since you brought up uh, as hard as it is to get to the big leagues, um, I, I was with the Bulls when that happened to you the first time. And I always love hearing the story of how they got called up. But yours was very unique because there aren't many stories of being called to the big leagues like what happened to you when Charlie Morton told you uh, what pulled you off of the on deck circle uh, in, in a game involving Durham uh, back in back in 2014. What do you remember about that? And for the fans who don't know the story, tell them. Yeah, it was definitely a whirlwind. I, when it happened, I wasn't expecting it at all. I mean, it wasn't like today where everything's on social media as much. Um, so you didn't really have a, as good of a sense of what was going on at the big league level. Um, I wasn't even aware at the time that Zobers was injured. Um, so when it happened, it was a complete shock. Uh, my teammates were awesome about it. Uh, Charlie, uh, definitely made it a little bit more theatrical, but I, I appreciated the moment and like <laughs> everything he did with that. Uh, but the funny part was I got in the, I got in the clubhouse and I'm sitting there and he's like, Hey, we're going to fly you to California. Uh, we're really excited for you, but you can't really tell anyone yet. And you're more than welcome to tell your wife and your mom or your dad, but we don't even know if you're going to be active tomorrow. And that's when, and that is actually probably more common than most people would think. Um, just because you don't know what the MRI is going to say in a day and how the player is going to feel. So, you know, I took the long flight out to California that next morning. And the whole time during the flight, I had no idea if I was just going to stay in the airport and go right back to Durham. <laughs> and to think of it after, you know, your teammates celebrate and all that stuff to to potentially go back would have just been, I don't know, it wouldn't have, yeah. it wouldn't have felt too good, I don't think. Um, but luckily, well, unluckily for Zobris, and you never want to wish yeah. that on something, but luckily for me, I got off the flight and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of that dream came true of, you know, riding in the Angel Stadium and being a big leaguer for Gosh. the first time. So, um, yeah, that moment was pretty special. So two follow-ups on that. A, you talked about how theatrical Charlie was. He didn't have much time to be theatrical, but what what did he do? And then B, what the situation you just described of taking a long flight, landing, turning around and coming back home, that happened like a month earlier with Eni Romero, didn't it? it wasn't he? He was sent out to Seattle. He, I think he landed in Detroit, if the, if the story serves me right, got a message that they don't need him. And he turned around and came right back to Durham. So that 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 does happen often. But uh, speak, speak to Charlie specifically about uh, what he did to dress up the moment in the short period of time he had. Uh, I mean, I think I think the his foresight and knowing that it was a special time for me and it being my first call up and us being so close. I had been on the team for a yeah. few years at that point, up at least parts of three seasons. Um, so it was really special for me to see him take the time to think about how can we make this special, mm -hmm. even it being like during the first inning of a game, making sure there was some time spent in the, in the dugout during a, a game that we're trying to win, uh, to really have that moment. And then after the game, you know, spending some time with me to talk about, you know, some things I could do to kind of prepare myself for that moment. Um, so, you know, in terms of the theater, it was more of like the on field on deck, you know, that was kind of the theater of it, but the, the substance, there was definitely substance behind it because yeah. of who he is as a person and our relationship at that point. So, yeah. and, uh, and really Ch Charlie and I are still really close and I, and I, I, without putting words in his mouth in, in my head, as you're talking about that in my mind, I'm thinking I, I would have, I would be surprised if he didn't do that because I think he saw a lot of you and him and a lot of him in you because he had plenty of doubt whether he was ever going to get a shot to go to big league baseball to be a coach or a manager and at that stage of their career did, did you have some doubt on whether or not the call would ever happen yeah i mean i think in players minds when it hasn't happened especially when you're kind of not the at least not kind of i wasn't the top prospect uh and you know you're fighting for your position in triple a every year there's definitely some doubt i think everyone's human and they would experience that i mean you're you try to be an optimist and you have to tell yourself you're the best player on the field when you're mm -hmm. playing. I think that's just the competitor in me and most in most players. Uh, but yeah, I, I do think in that moment, at least uh, that we shared after the game, I think uh, it was kind of special because of a similar pathway mm -hmm. and just maybe positional uh, similarities and just backgrounds. I think uh, mm -hmm. we, we just really bonded over that. So 
yeah, I was very appreciative of my time. And I actually saw him not that long ago. So we, uh, we talk about the moment quite often. Uh, so, so for the fans who, again, are, I, I try to give them a glimpse into what, what that first moment is like. So you, you land in, in, in California, you head out to Anaheim and you're called on to, to a pinch hit in your first game. And you're going up against another rookie uh, who's maybe in his sixth or seventh game and and Mike Morin uh, with the angels. What, what was it like when he got to the stadium, see your Jersey hanging in a locker and, when you finally get the tap from uh, from Madden saying, "Hey, you're going to come up and bat here uh, later in the game," it seems. I think all the players say this your first time. It's like it seems surreal. It doesn't seem like I had never been to Angel Stadium at the time. Uh, you see it in video games or on TV, and you know, <laughs> like it doesn't quite do it justice. Any big league park on TV it doesn't quite do it justice. Um, and yeah, I think that whole day you're running on adrenaline, not much sleep, uh, and then that first. Uh, at bat, uh, just stepping in the box in Angel Stadium, they have a, a huge uh, scoreboard out in center, and you look up and you're moving along because it, the camera is panned on you. And that's not something you experience in, in AAA very often, where you know you have this big camera that kind of like pointing in your face, and you're looking up and it's moving along every time you move. So that was a little jarring. Uh, and then the first plate appearance, I think I got down to two strikes pretty quickly. Uh, and I think all I was going through my head is like, just put it in play and just yeah. kind of fight for the next day at bat. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was, it was kind of, your legs are shaking and everything's kind of not working the way you want it to, but eventually that kind of dies down yeah. and you can kind of get into the flow of the game. Yeah. What, what are your memories of, of your time in Durham? Because uh, you were there in 2012, regular in 2013, played about half the season in 2014. 2012, as I mentioned, was my first year, and that was an awful, awful win-loss season. Mike Sandoval and I, I think, shouldered a lot of the blame for that because Charlie had always won, and we were the only two new guys, and and the team the team stunk. Um, and then the next year, you win the Governor's Cup. We played for the national championship. And then in 14, you were on that uh, on the field when Arusne Castillo hit the base hit against uh, against Libertor to tie up the game in game four, and then to go on to win, and then win the next day and win it. But uh, well, br broadly speaking, your, your memories of Durham, when I say – playing for the Durham Bulls, wearing that uniform and your time in Durham, how would you, what, what comes to the front of your mind? Um, yeah, I, I tell a lot of people that if I'm going to play AAA baseball, like Durham's the only place I would, I would want to play. Obviously it didn't work out that way just with the journey of my career, but uh, you know, Natalie and I, my wife, like we loved the Durham area so much. We even thought about living there full time. It just, mm -hmm. it was just a mm -hmm. special place for us one, because the memory of where I was in my baseball career at the time, it was some of my better years, um, the relationships we had with the staff um, in Durham, um, and then also just uh, just kind of the romanticizing of um, that team and how good we were in 23 yeah. uh, and 24. And I remember getting thrown out in 24 at the plate. I don't know if you remember that. I was the player who got thrown out at the plate to potentially send us to um, another national championship game. So um, that, that always kind of haunts me a little bit, but beyond <laughs> that, you know, winning the governor's cup is uh, something I'll, I'll never forget. And the actual Durham area um, and just being in, in the triangle is something that we truly appreciated and loved. All right. So, so walk, walk me through, uh, through that play of you getting thrown up because my memory and Scott Pose, my color commentator's memory were, were so walled off because even even once a year now, ten or eleven years later, it will come up where why why didn't Libertor why did you throw him a fastball to to Ruzne Castillo why did you throw him a, a slider with two strikes it's over you win the championship so so I have kind of blocked out all the memories from really anything but that pitch in the top of the ninth against Castillo so fill me in on on the throw at home plate yeah I I I, I want to say. Moore was hitting at the time. He's a left-handed hitter and he hits one ridiculously hard. It's a short, it's a short, shorter left field in Durham for yeah. people who don't know. And I think he hits a bullet to left. And I at the time I knew I had to get a good secondary because of how short the outfield was playing. Uh so I got as big as I possibly could without basically stealing the bag, but he had hit it so hard that, you know, it was a bang bang plate at the plate and unfortunately I got thrown out. Um yeah, I I think you know, I get back in the clubhouse and like to be that close to winning, you know, to winning again was just it was really tough. Um, but yeah, I, it's not something I think about often, but it is yeah. you know that twenty four season it does leave a little bit of bad taste in your mouth. Yeah, you invoke your dad earlier and growing up as part of a baseball family. You know, Jake Mangum's father played nine years in the NFL with the Chicago Bears and. 
Um, John, we had actually Jake and John on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. And uh, the one the one regret that John had was that Jake was just, he was two when John was winding down his career. He wishes he had an opportunity to either play while Jake was a little bit more aware, a little bit older, or for him to experience locker rooms as a five or six-year-old instead of two. Um, did you have the opportunity at all as a small kid? Was your dad still playing uh, when, when, when you were a little boy, did you have an opportunity to be in some clubhouses and meet some of his incredible teammates in the Cardinals organization? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I, they're very distant memories, but mm -hmm. yes, uh, he was playing AAA baseball um, when we were still around four. Um, so we definitely had some memories. I remember mm -hmm. being in Ottawa and him playing for the Lynx uh, and seeing snow for the first time. So um, okay. in terms of those days, I think it was a little bit more gray than him being a manager and yeah. being around some of those players uh, with Baltimore. Um, but yeah, I think being in the clubhouse, just goofing around, hitting in the cages. Uh, I can remember they were playing games and my brother and I were just in the cages kind of, you yeah. know, playing our own game at the time. So uh, yeah, it was a, it was a great way to grow up and the summers were yeah. always awesome because we got to go spend them on a baseball field. A two part question. Uh, be, being a young dad, as you are with what Coleman uh, is, what, two, two and a half or so. Um, a, what are the positives, negatives, drawbacks and incentives of being a father of a of a young boy working in baseball? And then B, uh, do you have any is there any pull to wear a uniform again and get back on the field staff? Or are you really liking the the position and the track that you're on now? Uh, so the first part uh, with the two-year-old, I know you're kind of experiencing the same. Uh, yeah. So we kind of we were talking about it yesterday. Uh, but yeah, it's been it's been incredible. I would have to say for anyone who's ever had a two-year-old, there's just uh, you know an energy level you need to keep up with them that sometimes mm -hmm. you just don't. Uh, <laughs> him growing up kind of around baseball, we haven't really seen any of the. Uh, he's still so young; it's hard to see the effects mm -hmm. of that. But I hope that his memories would be somewhat similar to mine and that, you know, he loves the game, but also it's not something I particularly am too worried about if he likes baseball or not mm -hmm. to be completely frank. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it can be difficult, you know, raising a young family in baseball, both as a player, or, you know, within the office. I mean, they're long days. Mm -hmm. You go into the ballpark in the morning and you have a night game and you don't see them until late at night, uh, potentially a morning or a lunch. Um, those days can be difficult and then you're on the road yeah, uh, yeah. quite a bit. So yeah, I think it's something that having a good home base and making sure the structure at home is good and everyone is taken care of as much as they can be and communicating. Um, mm -hmm. I think that makes it work for us for now, but uh, yeah, it's something that we all kind of enjoy kind of yeah. doing in the day to day. Yeah. And, and, and not, second, yeah, well, go ahead, please. I don't remember. Um, so the second part of it was, <clears throat> So I asked about, you know, if fatherhood and then uh, I forgot the second part as well. <laughs> oh, oh, about trying to put a uniform on and, and okay, coach yeah, your man. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's the one I definitely <laughs> wanted to omit there. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think um, I think I love what I'm doing now. The yeah. the challenges, both intellectually and just being around this, the, the players and the staff still, I get a lot of those interactions being in the clubhouse. Um, I've never really i to be completely honest i don't know i think i put on a pair of pants twice there's two managers that have been able to get me to wear a pair of pants uh pre-game and then one during the game since i've been out so it hasn't been something i've really gravitated to since i've been out but um yeah you never know where where things will take you but it's not something that i think about too often what what were the stories that that got you into those pants for those two days one was craig albernaz and you can know how convincing uh Craig oh, yeah. about anything in life. <laughs> uh and the other was Rafi Valenzuela. We we were in the um mm. the FCL and it was during COVID. And unfortunately a lot of our staff got went down oh. that day. And I was one of the only other staff members around. And he's like, hey, I need <laughs> someone in the dugout to help. Uh so I put on a pair of pants and helped him in the dugout that day. So uh really those were the only only two times. How about that? As, uh, and I don't want to turn this into like a walk down memory lane, but uh, the the three managers for whom you played in the big leagues are all big names, like you know Clint Hurdle and you know Joe Madden and your your manager with uh, with 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 the Yankees and uh, Joe Girardi. Um, what 
and, and you played for some other great managers on your way up through minor league baseball as well. Uh, w- w- how special were they? Or what what special moments? What special lessons did you perhaps learn from one, two, or or all of them? Yeah, I mean, I spent more or less time with with Joe um, and Clint, um, uh, Joe Madden. Uh, Girardi was a basically a, a cup of coffee. I think I was up for maybe a few days. Uh, so not as much of a relationship uh, there. Um, I think the big thing with Joe uh, was he was really good at making some of those first moments pretty special. Um, he put on a hit and run for my first hit. Um, it was against Sonny Gray. I think I was scuffling a little bit. I was like 0 for 8 or 9 or something like that. And he put on a hit and run. And I got the hit. And then after the game, he gave me the lineup card. And he's like, "On he, I have the it framed in my house. And it says, I knew you wouldn't miss the sign. <laughs> so uh that was pretty that was pretty cool um and then with clint i think the thing with clint is he he tried to make sure that every day was different um mm-hmm. and that you were kind of feeling the love for the game he really harped on the the culture and the community and the family and um i think that was something i i took for him is like this game is so hard and to not not stress so much about the things going on on the field that there are other things that can take you away and kind of give you some reprieve. So. All right. Well, as, as we wind things down with the call, first off, thank you for your time. And I always make sure that I bring up um, the better halves on these relationships uh, on these podcasts. And, and I certainly would love to have you speak for a couple of minutes about, about your wife, her job being Coleman's mom and, uh, and, and kind of walking right alongside you in this, uh, crazy wild baseball chase that we've been on for decades. No, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. So Natalie is, uh, kind of, I think what most would say is, and most would have in these baseball families is kind of the rock of our, our Mm -hmm. family. I mean, the sacrifice, uh, that they make on a day-to-day basis, um, to make sure when you come home, um, that everything isn't going crazy because that can be work yeah. most days. Um, and not just that, it's, it's, it's a two way street where we have to make sure that, you know, they are getting kind of what they need as well. They're getting those mm-hmm. times away, getting those pressures and we try to make sure we, we put those in, but yeah, we've, mm-hmm. we've been together. It's crazy to think about. We've been together since 2008. Mm-hmm. Um, that was the year I got drafted. She, she's like, I think we were dating for two months right before I got drafted. And she goes, okay, uh, you got drafted by the Padres. That's cool. I get to go to San Diego. And I go, no, we're going to, uh, <laughs> we're going to Eugene, Oregon. She goes, oh boy. <laughs> uh, so that being her first introduction into baseball. And now she, she probably knows more about baseball than just about anyone I know, just to show her kind of like passion for the game, I guess, for lack of a better term, That's or her, at least her, her knowledge of the game. So yeah, I think that's what you need in these, in these situations is someone to understand and you to understand what they're going through and yeah. we try to make it work as best as possible. So love her to death. And, you know, she's at home probably waiting for my phone call right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't keep you, but I will, I will follow up and say, so the draft in what in 08, so it had been in, so you guys met maybe in April or March of 08. How, how did you meet and uh, who asked who out on the first date? We met through a common friend uh, that worked. She worked as an AT for the ball club. Okay. Um, Yeah, there was no social media platforms like we have today. So it was kind of, uh, I think we met at uh, an ice cream place, like TCBY. I don't know if this, are those still around? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I don't hold their stock anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, we met at a TCBY and it was a group event and kind of went from there. It is it is quite strange when you think about when you meet people yeah. for the first time, yeah. how that all comes to be and what little things kind of get you to that point. But yeah, I, I am very appreciative of uh, our AT at Florida to set us up and then to kind of have that moment. Oh, that's right. So so go Gators to you. Um, Cole, it's it's always such a pleasure to, to bump into you again a couple of times this summer that we see you. It's like we'd pick off where we left off the last time that we chatted. So thank you for your time. Thank you for shining a light on your job, that uh, the, the fantastic job you're doing with the Tampa Bay Rays. And uh, looking forward to having you on again. I appreciate your time. Thank you again for having me. Yeah, that was great.
All right, so there's Colt Figueroa, the director of baseball operations with the Tampa Bay Rays. A reminder, every Monday is when the new podcast drops right here on the Durham Bulls podcast. You can subscribe and like on Spotify, on, on Apple, and also on our YouTube page, which is Durham Bulls TV. So for Jatelvi McDuffie, our post-production expert for Cole Figueroa and everybody involved with the Durham Bulls podcast, I'm Patrick Canis. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week on the Durham Bulls podcast.